Scandinavian Design 101. I'm Sanna. I'm Andreas. And we're two Swedes and we love design. Yeah, we do. And today we're going to talk about the Danish architect Finn Juhl. Specifically focusing on his organic furniture made for the Copenhagen Cabinet Makers Guild's exhibitions in the late 30s and early 40s. If you're interested in a more general video about his life and career... We have one available as well. You can find it in the link in the description if you want to watch that. But for now, let's concentrate on a few years in Yule's career characterized by organic shapes, experimentation and furniture that looked nothing like the strict pieces previously designed by Kåre Klint and other modernists. In the mid-1930s, young Danish designers embraced a soft and organic aesthetic uh, which differed greatly from the modernistic furniture. The pioneers at the Bauhaus school in Germany uh, had concluded that form followed function and overstuffed furniture uh, was considered outdated. In the Nordic countries, followers like Bruno Mattsson and Alvar Aalto preferred linen webbing over ordinary upholstery uh, as it was affordable, practical and hygienic, particularly since fleas were a significant issue back then. And indoor smoking was the norm rather than exception. Yeah, but that uh, had to be in the webbing too. Uh, yeah, yeah, mm. a bit, but not, mm. not as much mm. as uh, in like this overstuffed ah, uh, furniture. Um, so overstuffed furniture and a lot of textile was obviously a problem then. Yeah, you don't <laughs> yeah. want fleas in it. <laughs> no, you don't. But however, young designers like yeah, Arne Jacobsen and Finn Juhl couldn't resist dreaming of bulky and comfortable chairs with soft lines. And perhaps uh, this was a reaction against the dominating doctrines uh, where traditional wooden furniture was the prevailing style. And in 1935, Fleming Lassen introduced his iconic Tired Man, a soft and cozy easy chair that looked unlike anything the audience had ever seen before. Uh, and in this environment, young uh, Finn Juhl embarked on his career as a furniture designer, even though he had never actually studied furniture design. Mm. Juhl studied architecture at the Royal mm -hmm. Danish Academy of Fine Arts between 1930 and 34, and unlike most of his fellow students, he had his own apartment. Ooh. Eager to furnish his home with furniture of his own designs, he approached the cabinet maker Niels Wodder as early as 1933. Which marked the beginning mm. of a successful collaboration that lasted for decades. Juhl and Wodder made their debut together in 1937 at the Copenhagen Cabinet Makers Guild's exhibition. Yeah. <laughs> that is kind of a Long tongue name. twister. And these annual exhibitions started in 1926 as, as a response to industrialization and the increasing import of furniture from low-wage countries overseas. The Cabinet Makers Guild mm. uh, organized these e exhibitions until 1966, mm. so that is a very long time. Yeah, yeah. Is it 40 years? More yeah, more? almost. Uh... And held design competitions where cabinet makers were paired up with designers to create innovative furniture. Almost all of today's famous designers made their debut at these exhibitions, mm -hmm. including Hans J. Wegner in 38, Börje Mogensen in 39, just to mention a few. Yeah. Juhl participated for the first time in 1937, presenting a living room filled with some peculiar pieces of furniture. Yeah. Among other things, uh, there was a wall-mounted bookcase appearing minimalistic and purely functional, aligning well with the dominating aesthetic of the time. Additionally, there was a folding table with matching dining chairs, looking like something a Kåre Klint could have designed. However, the most remarkable pieces were an overstuffed sofa with a matching easy chair, inspired by the organic aesthetic promoted by architects like Fleming Lassen. 
The sofa stood on a low wooden base, while the easy chair had four simplistic legs. The most uh, distinctive uh, feature was the armrests, pointing upwards like the flippers on a seal. Unfortunately, the critics were far from convinced, uh, and the uh, easy chair was even compared to a deflated rubber ball in the newspaper Politiken. <laughs> Moreover, cabinet makers were skeptical of these uh, overstuffed uh, pieces, since all the woodwork was actually concealed inside mm. the upholstery. Of As for the fate of the furniture after the exhibition, it remains unclear and it's possible they are lost in time. Nevertheless, Yul would soon return to these organic shapes in his designs. Mm. And during that time, Finn Yul worked for the architect Wilhelm Lauritsen, contributing to the design of the new radio building in Copenhagen, a significant project that involved creating custom furniture and lamps. Although Yule's name appeared on many of the sketches, he claimed that all furniture was actually designed by Lauritsen. Uh, however, some noticeable similarities existed between the sofa used in the radio building and the sofa exhibited by Yule in the same year. Yeah. In 1938, Yule took a completely different approach on the annual Cabinet Makers exhibition. Drawing inspiration from ancient predecessors, he designed a chair that was unlike any other chair at the time. The chair featured a unique tri triangular formation for both the front and back legs, and its upholstered backrest had an unusually large top. Unlike his previous designs, this chair proudly displayed all its joints and wooden details. Despite its innovation, the chair, known as the grasshopper chair, received criticism for its lack of uh, consistency and unconventional construction. Only two chairs were ever produced and they didn't sell, so Yul uh, kept them in his own home. And recently the model was reintroduced in, um, into production by House of in Yul. Mm. Though some uh, question uh, whether this peculiar chair truly deserves a place among Yule's extraordinary pieces designed later in his career, uh, which are rightfully considered masterpieces. Yeah. But this grasshopper is, it's strange. Mm. In 1939, uh, Yule revisited the designs from 37 and presented an absolutely stunning mm. organic sofa along with a matching easy chair. While the basic shape of the easy chair remained, both the seat and legs received a much more modern touch. However, the most striking differences were evident in the sofa. Instead of a relatively heavy construction with traditional elements, the 1939 sofa represented a modern sculpture influenced by artists like Gishan Arp. The unique shape not only served as a design feature, but also allowed for various seating positions. I like that. Mm -hmm. And significantly reduced the weight of the piece, yeah. which is also nice. Yeah. Nils Wodder's exceptional mm. skills were crucial in creating mm. these magnificent shapes. However, the design was considered too bold for the general yeah. public, and the model was not put into production. For a long time, it was believed that these remarkable pieces were lost forever, but in 2020, they resurfaced. <laughs> in December of that year, the group was sold for almost 600,000 by the auction house Brun Rasmussen. Yeah. In 1940, Finn Juhl once again redesigned his organic easy chair, aiming to better accommodate the human body and give it a more logical shape. Despite its large size, an overstuffed chair does not automatically guarantee comfort. It still needs to be adapted to the human autonomy, uh, with soft and firm areas in the right places. You, like a person. Yeah, <laughs> like a person. <laughs> you made a crucial uh, decision to flip the armrests upside down, transforming them from resembling a seal's flippers to resembling the resting wings of a large uh, bird. Smart move. Yeah. 
The model is known is today known as the Pelican Chair, although it doesn't necessarily resemble a pelican. Instead, Yul may have been thinking of to replicate the shape of a human torso, I think. <laughs> Why isn't it called that? Yeah, the tor torso, torso chair. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. better. Yeah. Initially, many critics were unimpressed, and the chair was sometimes uh, mockingly referred to as the tired walrus. <laughs> And commercially, it was not successful, produced in small numbers and soon forgotten. However, in recent time, the Pelican Share has uh, been brought back into production and, and has become one of Yule's most uh, popular designs. Yeah, of course. But it took like 50 years, mm. 60 years. Long time. <laughs> yeah. As we have observed, none of these organic overstuffed furniture pieces became commercially successful mm. right away, uh, with critics often criticizing them for being too sculptural, unconventional, and not functional enough. Mm. However, Finn Yule persisted in designing such mm. furniture. In 1941, he launched the FJ41 sofa, which he designed for his own home and exhibited at the 1941 Copenhagen Cabinet Makers Guild exhibition. Yeah. <laughs> Initially, it had no nickname. Mm. Uh, Four years later, Yule designed a somewhat similar sofa, mm. but only one prototype was ever produced by Nils Wodder. This prototype was exhibited at the annual exhibition and later given to Wodder's daughter, uh, Kirsten, who was married to the poet Frank Jäger. Yeah? I don't know that person. No, uh, perhaps the Danes knew him. Perhaps. <laughs> I haven't really heard about him. In 1950, the cartoonist Jörgen Mogensen created a comic strip Poeten och Lillemor, the poet and Lillemor. Lillemor is a name. <laughs> yeah, inspired by his close friends Frank and Kirsten. Mm -hmm. uh, the prototype sofa by Jul was frequently featured in his cartoon and mm -hmm. at some point uh, there was confusion and the FJ41 sofa was mistakenly nicknamed Poeten the poet, mm. even though it was not featured in the cartoon. Oh. And this confusion is somewhat understandable as only a few people had ever seen this prototype, while the FJ41 sofa was well known among design enthusiasts. Mm. And before we show you several organic pieces designed by Yule, let's take a moment to understand why the critics tended to mock them during their time. While the general public found these pieces too extreme, one would expect the design critics to appreciate them, the bowl shapes and mm. so on. Uh, however, this was not the case. And one possible reason for this could be that the leading critics were proponents of the modernist moments, moment, <laughs> where function was the primary focus. Uh, Jules' furniture from the late 30s was indeed functionalistic in its own way, but it was something more than that. They were um, artistic creations closely related to sculptures by uh, artists like Sean Arp, for example. And uh, form played a crucial role, role in this design, which might have annoyed most functionalists. Mm, possibly. During that period, the strict doctrines of Corey Klint still dominated the Danish design scene, and Yule represented something entirely different. As a young and unestablished designer without formal education in furniture design, it was nearly impossible to convince the critics. Yul went his own way, creating a unique aesthetic, but he paid a price for it. The critics remained unconvinced and customers often chose more traditional pieces over his designs. Despite this initial resistance, Yule's work would later gain appreciation and recognition, becoming highly regarded in the world of design. Yeah. And we will now end this video with some organic pieces designed by Yule in the 30s, 40s and 50s. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for watching. Thank you so much.